Hello and welcome live to the World Crypto Network. We're here joined with the one and only Murad, uh, that is known on Twitter as Must Stop Murad. Uh, but let's let's see if they can stop this conversation that we're going to have right here, right now. As Murad, how are you doing? And uh, nice to have you on the show. Thanks for joining. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, things are going well. How how are you? Well, I'm fantastic. Uh, it's 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 nice to, to talk to you on Twitter for some time. I uh, really enjoyed your appearances on both uh, the uh, Tales of the Crypt show and the Stefan Levera podcast. So those were two amazing shows that you uh, should go and listen to. Uh, and I'm glad you were there and talked a lot about the Austrian economic side of Bitcoin, a lot about the philosophy of Bitcoin and why this sound money is so important. Uh, so clearly you are uh, upon others influenced by this uh, Austrian school of economics and by the philosophy of liberty. Uh, so this is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Uh, to start off, you uh, you gave a reading to me by the great Murray Rothbard, uh, which we're just going to start off reading. And that is a, uh, or just, uh, yeah, Murad, how did you uh, find this paper and uh, or this article? Um, so, I mean, I've been reading uh, Austrian economics for several years, and um, the monetary economics part of it in particular has always been uh, a very fascinating aspect uh, to me. And um, I have essentially sort of been delving into um, Rothbard, DeSoto, Hulsman ever since. Oh yeah, Holtzman is fantastic on especially the ethics and and the philosophy of money production, uh, which is uh, fantastic. Sure. If you go back in the archives, you'll find a nice interview with uh, Jörg Guido Holtzman here on the World Crypto Network at Mises University. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and guess what? Uh, Dr. Holtzman might be back. Uh, we'll take a while to schedule that, uh, but he will eventually come back here to the World Crypto Network. So that's something I'm already super excited for. Uh, but now let's get going with the reading here. Uh, this is from the free man. And uh, you know how much this is going to be uh, a libertarian uh, document if it was published in the free man. Uh, back in 1995, so that is one of, of last Murray's, uh, you know, last articles in his late years. And it's, as always, uh, a great article in its entirety. Uh, but we're going to especially read the chapter. Uh, I think I already scrolled past it, or uh, not the chapter, but uh, here, this paragraph. Uh, so let's, you can join us in reading. Money is different from all other commodities. Other things being equal, more shoes or more discoveries of oil or copper benefit society, since they help alleviate natural scarcity. But once a commodity is established as a money on the market, no more money at all is needed. Since the only use of money is for exchange and reckoning, more dollars or pounds or marks in circulation cannot confer a social benefit. They will simply dilute the exchange value of every existing dollar or pound or mark. So it is a great boon that gold or silver are scarce and are costly to increase in supply. Uh, so that is a fantastic reading. Uh, Murad, uh, what is uh, Murray talking here uh, about in this article? He's talking about the importance of money being sound and hard uh, in terms of its supply. And essentially, uh, obviously in his day, gold was considered to be the soundest form of money. Uh, it's essentially a criticism of uh, government ordained fiat currency um, in the sense that its supply is uh, arbitrarily changeable, uh, m most often in the direction of expanding the supply. And there are a lot of not only ethical but directly economic problems with um, unpredictable money supply. Um, both from the perspective of diluting the existing holders of currency, but also from the perspective of ruining the information theoretic signaling mechanism that money possesses. Um, but also um, the ethics of it is that it's very important to consider it, where the new money enters the economy. And that can cause 
all kinds of sort of distortions that many people whose ethics and morals many people uh, could debate at length. Oh yes, absolutely. The importance of a money is that it is a, a stable money that will not change in the so-called stock to flow ratio, in the inflation rate. And you put out a fantastic tweet uh, just a little bit ago um, talking about the issuance rate of Bitcoin, talking about this, uh, the annual change in money supply. For Bitcoin, Ethereum, the US monetary base, the broad money, M3, the US dollar monetary base average, average. And you know what we see here in, is in the history that the, uh, this one is the US monetary base has increased drastically and then decreased drastically several times. It is really, really volatile. Uh, so if people speak of a volatile currency, uh, they often mean the Bitcoin purchasing power. But what we see here is that especially the US dollar has been really volatile, maybe not so much on the purchasing power, but especially so on the money supply. So where is the difference here between being volatile in the purchasing power and volatile in the money supply? That's a very good question. And it's such a, even that comment, even that question betrays such high time preference and such impatience because obviously um, gold on, like if you imagine a time in human civilization when gold was just discovered for the first time, clearly nine years after its discovery, it wasn't price stable either. Uh, monetization takes time. People's, uh, people sort of game theoretically converging on, on a new superior form of money takes time. Uh, Bitcoin right now is still moving between the collectible and the store of value phases. And uh, it's not going to be stable overnight. For gold and other metals, um, monetization took thousands of years. Now, of course, uh, I believe, as many others do, that in the case of Bitcoin, this monetization will happen faster due to the interconnected of the world due to the internet, due to its digital borderless nature, due to the much higher level of globalization. Uh, but still, uh, it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't even happen in nine years. We ha this, this whole thing is a 30, 40, 50 year project and we have to be patient. And we have to, it, the monetization happens step by step. Um, so Bitcoin is trustworthy because a lot of aspects of Bitcoin and in my view, most importantly, its monetary policy is trustworthy. Uh, it hasn't changed at all so far since the beginning. And most importantly, it's very interesting and beautiful. The game theoretic uh, aspect of Bitcoin is set up in a way that no Bitcoin holder wants it greater inflation than what, what is currently, what, what, what the current supply curve is, because that would essentially dilute the wealth of every holder. Uh, the very like Bitcoins, a lot of people debate what's the most beautiful part about Bitcoin. To me, uh, the most beautiful, the most ingenious aspect of Bitcoin's design is the difficulty adjustment, which makes it different to all commodities. But the most beautiful thing about Bitcoin to me is the fact that it's trending towards fixed supply. And that is what makes it hard money. That's it, what makes it sound money. Uh, Selgin called it a synthetic commodity. Uh, McIntyre called it a quasi fiat community money. To me, the semantics don't matter. What matters is that it's trustless and what matters is that the supply curve is very very hard to change and that's what's really important i i think you said it perfectly here in the in the last sentence this sentence that the supply rate is never going to change and this is what i really love about this chart uh something that m some people might not even realize we see the history of all these currencies, right? We see the history of all these money supplies, even this one of Ether, <laughs> as pathetic as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the, the central banking, the Marxist uh, <laughs> Janet oh, Yellen curve? It, it, it's horrible, right? It's horrible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hilarious, actually. But what I love is that all of these currencies stop 
at this present moment. Why? Because we have no idea what the right. Fed is going to do next Friday. We right. have no idea what the Ethereum Foundation, Foundation. <laughs> is going to do with the money supply if they yeah. choose to print themselves some new money into their own pockets. Right. And we have no clue what these people are going to do with the money supply. But look at this. Look at what will steadily continue going. Just keep going and going and going is Bitcoin. Why? Not because the, the, supply in, the, the supply curve is locked in the code. Yes, it is written down in the code, but that can be easily done. What is important is that it cannot be changed out of the code. And right. that is why the important that is the importance of running a full node. That is what the user activated software told us that if users run a full node, nobody is going to change even one single bit of the consensus to a right. more looser restriction. Right. I think even it's also it's also very good that uh, Satoshi essentially gave it like twenty years before it like goes below like. 0.5% or whatever, it's very, it, like it gives the world time to get used to it. Like not essentially sudden an introduction of a totally hard money, but um, I guess mining introduces a distribution mechanism uh, and the inflation gradually decreases every halving makes. So technically Bitcoin gets harder every 10 minutes. Yeah. It's stock to flow ratio increases every 10 minutes, but the halvings in particular, they are the big jumps and um, those jumps, I believe, are very, very important in Bitcoin's pricing and in marking sort of the beginning or even the middle of the sort of the bullish waves. And in general, they are such a critical aspect of sort of what makes Bitcoin unique. Um, I think like even the philosophies aside, the morals and ethics aside, I believe that Bitcoin's hardness versus other monetary media is eventually going to absorb and attract continuously greater inflows of wealth, especially as its hardness is more sort of intimately and palpably felt. Oh, really, really interesting point that you bring up here, because I, I do think, although this is one of the ingenious ways of introducing a sound money really slowly to have a lot of the infl inflation in the early days, by the way, Bitcoin was highly inflationary in the early right. days, nothing like a sound money, nothing whatsoever. Uh, with like several, several tens and twenties and thirties percent inflation rate. That is right. a really, really loose, not hard money. Um, and what, what we, what this of course gave us was a subsidy for the transaction fees. And a, a big part why Satoshi had to do this is because it's expensive to secure such a network as Bitcoin. It's not efficient. It costs a lot of money costs a lot of value to hold the system up securely finance right. with the transaction fees of early users it would not be enough why right. the users did not value this currency enough because it was not secure enough it was not a store of value yet and they they would not pay for such a system because there was no value yet uh, and in order to get that value it needed to have that security but right. somebody had to pay for that security and that was why the inflation mechanism was necessary to right. subsidize the security in the early days to make For the sure. bootstrapping possible. Right. Because in the early in the early stages, it wasn't used as a payment mechanism enough for the fees to be enough. So you needed to sort of use the high inflation early on to incentivize miners to sort of contribute this tremendous amounts of hardware and energy towards its security. Um, you bring up the very, very good point. Even uh, even safety in um, in a conversation with me, he mentioned your uh, very interesting observation that the sort of loose money policy of the early ages created the whole Bcash philosophy, and it created um, this wave of sort of uncareful use of the block space and malinvestment in these silly projects that want to all of which want to live in on the on chain. And essentially, um, very, very sort of high time preference, very impatient, very uh, sort of I want the chocolate here right now type malinvestments. Um, it, it, is there any chance you can expand on that a little bit, actually? 
the the interesting thing about Austrian economics is that it does not constrain itself to one type of money. It is not only used in gold. It is not only used in exchange. Right. Yeah. It is it is a fundamental uh, theory, a fundamental uh, concept uh, that that has axioms in it, and these axioms apply to anything, regardless what it is. So we can use all the all these concepts that Mises and Rothbard explained in the, their theory of the business cycle, and apply it to Bitcoin. Uh, so what is uh, in in theory of money and credit? What is Mises' big argument of the uh, of the uh, business or the, the start of the business cycle. It is inflation. It is an increase in the money supply. It is a decrease in the sto stock to flow ratio. And right. it, it, it comes on two different sides. One of it is the overconsumption aspect that is on the, uh, let's say, uh, user of the currency side. Then we have the malinvestment aspect uh, that is on the company side, on the entrepreneur side, on right. the allocation of resources side. Right. So the overconsumption basically means because we have an increase in the amount uh, in the uh, amount of the supply of money, we have a decrease. Uh, you know, all things being equal, a decrease in its price, in its purchasing power, and this means that the users will more likely have to spend their money now because in the future, uh, it's a time aspect here. In the future, this is going to be worth less. Uh, so a inflatable money supply means that you do. Uh, you know, th that you spend sooner, that you consume sooner, and uh, you waste money. It's the consumerism culture that we have all around us in, in the Western society. It's horrible in many ways. Um, right. And, you know, in Bitcoin, this is Satoshi Dice. This is just, you know, gambling away your money. Uh, this is uh, spending your, your money on drugs in the, on the Silk Road, right? That is yeah. that is the although that might not be too bad, right? I'm not saying anything against that, uh, but it is it is the short time preference, right? Uh, it is the I want to have I want to consume now, uh, right. and this is the one side of the uh, of this theory. Right. You could argue that in the very early ages, Bitcoin was used more as a payment rail rather than an actual store of value because the incentives of storing it weren't were weren't there quite yet. Um, the I would love to expand on your second point. I believe that because the money expands and it enters the economy through the financial system predominantly in today's age, it um, artificially decreases the interest rate, which sends a wrong signal to the entrepreneurs. Um, so like because the supply of money has expanded does not and the interest rate is low, does not necessarily mean that the factors of production and the capital goods are there enough to satisfy all those sort of entrepreneurial ventures. And you end up essentially, metaphorically speaking, with more houses starting to get built, but only some of them finished essentially. And a lot of these unfinished projects, a lot of investments in dog walking startups and a lot of silly, <laughs> silly, 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 stupid things that aren't really like sort of important. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, this this is basically you know it. We need to allocate resources, and there are only a limited amount of them. We live in a scarce right. world, uh, right. so we have to do something, right? And the question is, what are entrepreneurs going to do with these scarce resources in a right. uncertain future? They have to plan for the future, uh, because the consumers will need their satisfaction not today, but in the future, because right. the entrepreneur first has to build the stuff, right? Right. Just because just because you expanded the money supply doesn't mean that the economy has grown yet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But the entrepreneurs think so. Right. That's the dangerous part. It right. is not happening. People are not saving money. That is not up, that is not increasing the supply. No, they're not saving money. They're not investing money. They are actually consuming more, as I explained earlier. Right. So they are, they are right. contrary to what the entrepreneurs believe. Uh, the uh, the entrepreneurs believe that the people want all this stuff. They they, they, uh, they uh, but not now, but in the future. On the contrary, though, the people want it now and not in the future. Uh, but then the entrepreneurs that are planning, they will use all those resources up to date in order to build something tomorrow. Right. Which, of course, is, uh, you know, uh, two different directions. So if interest rates were decided by the free market, uh, you think the biggest sort of um, factors deciding that would be people's propensity to save money? Basically, yes. Uh, of course, there's a risk factor in that as well. You, you have yeah. to factor in the uncertainty of getting your money back. Uh, is there a custodial risk maybe even? Uh, right. th that will all be priced into the good. 
Uh, but basically, uh, you know, the, the pure rate of interest, so to speak, uh, is based on time preference. And right. that, that is why, why it is so bad if a central planner meddles with this interest rate, because it literally messes with the people's brains. Because if you change the, the money, if you change the interest rate, people assume that they can, you know, have a different mental attitude and economic attitude. And so changing this is not just something that affects money only, it's, it's off the mind as well. Um, a lot of sort of Keynesians make the annoying argument that if the interest rates is de decided by the free market, then it would be higher than what it is today. And essentially like people would take less risks or there would be like less investment into like innovation. What is your, uh, what, what is like the best argument against that do you think? And that, and the second sort of side of that question is when you come to like, venture capital investors that will exist in a sound money society. Your essentially, I would imagine that your business plan and your research would need to be a lot more elaborate than it is today. And it, like it, everything would need to be planned and calculated much more sort of much more uh, intensely and professionally and in greater depth than it is today. Correct. The thing is, the, or the question is, what is your benchmark? If your benchmark is fiat currency that will drastically lose in value, you don't have to make that good of a pitch because even if your entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity is not that profitable, you're still better than the base money, right? Uh, so people buy right. this investment more of a, as a store of value aspect to hedge themselves against the inflation. Uh, so they don't really do it that much because of the investment return that they want to have out of it. Although that's, of course, a big part in a sound right. money thing. You have to outperform Bitcoin. Are you sure that your venture can outperform Bitcoin? Really? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, so, is, that is so. The argument, the, the argument of inflationists is that because bit, because uh, in an age where hyper Bitcoinization happens, uh, people would be much people would invest much carefully because they would essentially like the. Um, do you agree with the idea that at maturity? Bitcoin's per because it's a deflationary money, uh, its purchasing power would be like increasing by two percent per year or something like that, right? Around that, around those levels. You know, that's again the thing. What what dictate or what causes the the volatility in the purchasing power? Well, fundamentally, it's supply and demand. What is right. supply and demand affected by? Of course, on the supply side, it's the supply of the currency available. And if this is stable. Uh, if yeah. this is that does not change by whim, if this is predictable until infinity, right? Uh, then we can then we have this one side of the equation solved, right? There are only th th those many bitcoins on the market, no more, no less. Perfect. Uh, we don't have to to mind that much more about that. On then it's only a question on demand, and if it's only a question on demand, then we need to ask how useful is Bitcoin so that many people will use it, and. The question then is how useful of a money is Bitcoin? Of course, that then goes directly into what are the aspects of a money? What does a money need to be good at um, in order to, uh, you know, to count as a as a useful and as a good money? And we talk first about here the, the, the inflation rate. Yes, absolutely. But Murad, you also have a, a nice picture here that or a tweet here. And I quote you now, now that we are all Bitcoin maximalists, I hope we are, we need to take it to the next step and get rid of the confusion surrounding the monetary evolution of Bitcoin. Uh, this is a phenomenal picture. Um, so Morat, would you just uh, explain a bit further uh, what this uh, picture is talking about? Yeah, for sure. So a lot of um, altcoiners, smart contract platforms, pioneers, Bcashers, Ripple heads, etc. They have really confused a lot of people, especially sort of like on the outskirts of the market uh, about sort of how money emerges, why does it accrue value, what makes it valuable, um, how the evolution of the winner is going to process, etc. Some people who completely misunderstand monetary economics have even been arguing that medium of exchange has to come before a store of value, which just like makes no sense at all to me. Um, and it, a lot of people essentially confuse means of payment with a medium of exchange. And those are completely different things. Um, so it's important for everybody to converge on one and the correct narrative. 
And the correct narrative, which has originally been uh, outlined by uh, Vijay Boyapati in his article, The Bullish Case for Bitcoin, and also uh, more extensively in Safety's book, The Bitcoin Standard. Um, the, the thesis, very roughly, is that Bitcoin has to evolve from uh, a digital collectible to a store of value to a medium of exchange and then to a unit of account. And essentially, um, the argument is that Bitcoin already has the properties to be uh, a global money. Of course, sort of things like Lightning and, and other sort of uh, extensions are going to help a lot. But essentially, like the basics are there. But what's happening, the argument is that uh, Bitcoin is not a bubble, but rather a, a, an asset, a monetary asset, which is under slowly undergoing monetization. And the argument is that the bigger Bitcoin becomes, uh, the more it is, uh, the more the sort of the day to day or week to week, month to month vol price volatility or purchasing power volatility is going to decrease. Uh, the more liquid is going to it, it, the more liquid it is going to be, the more saleable it is going to be. And eventually, um, it, generally, people would prefer for their day to day currency to be uh, relative to day to day currency and day to day medium of exchange to be relatively stable. Uh, and like ha expecting people to be spending their bitcoins right now on a coffee just makes no sense. That's the same as. In, for example, most of the Bitcoin holders believe that it has a potential to be 100, 200 times bigger in the future. So why would you spend it on coffee right now? That is like investing uh, in, in an early stage company that you're very, very excited about and then going and spending the stock of the company at a coffee store. That just totally makes no sense. So uh, Bitcoin right now is still a bet that a, because it critically has all the uh, unique properties to be money, to be is a particularly good store of value. It's very scarce. It's very easily transferable. It's very divisible. Uh, it's relatively fungible. Uh, it's uh, very portable. Um, it's borderless, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the, the right now, people who are investing in Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin are making the bet that more and more people will essentially choose Bitcoin as their money, uh, either speculative, specul speculatively, more speculatively at first, but eventually more seriously, and it will become a store of value. As it becomes bigger, uh, the volatility is likely to decrease. And even more importantly, the disincentives to spend are gradually going to decrease as well. So right now, there's still 100x, 200x ahead. But uh, as it gets bigger and bigger, uh, because there's only so much wealth in the world, it will, re it, it, will st it will begin stabilizing and there will only be so much growth ahead that eventually, because of the less and disincentive to spend, people would be more willing to spend it on day-to-day -day goods uh, than uh, they are today. And as it gets even more stable from that point, it could potentially one day become a cap. I agree with pretty much everything that you said, but what I, where I would like to challenge your point a little bit, uh, although I, I do think that you agree with me on, on, on that point because it's just a minor uh, deviation, is that although there is a very, very high disincentive to spend Bitcoin, obviously, uh, there is a time preference element involved. And of course, we need to consume something. Right. Sure. We need to sure. we need to live. We need to eat. We need to have housing. We need to have clothes and stuff like that. Uh, so eventually we will have to spend something because we need to consume something and either we are going to produce it spending our own resources or we're going to buy it uh, of course again spending our own resources that we have accumulated uh, but eventually we will have to get rid of them in order to consume something and I, yeah I, I agree with you 100 percent a lot of sort of Keynesians make a weird argument that oh uh, if it's going to be a deflationary money, if it's going to sort of increase in purchasing power by one to two percent every year, then everybody's just going to hoard it all, and no one is going to spend it all, which is totally not true. Like people still need to eat, people still need to drink, people still need to spend, and more importantly, uh, as Bitcoin gets bigger and bigger, other people will demand it for their goods and for their services and for their labor. So, like whether you like it or not, and even though it's much sounder and much better money and a much better savings mechanism than fiat was, you will still have to spend it eventually. Yes, 
uh, the like immediate consumerism might decrease a little bit, um, and say and the rate of savings could increase. Um, but I would actually argue that that's a good thing, because because as Holzman and many other Austrian econ Austrian economists correctly note that the um, the delay in consumption it doesn't exist in forever. It doesn't exist in perpetuity, but rather it's transferred from like buying like stupid sneakers or candy bars or some other plastic stuff today. Uh, and it get transferred to more sort of long-term, uh, more um, lower time, the, the time preferences get altered by the very nature of money. And it, but essentially people engage in longer term projects and they would dedicate themselves to sort of accumulating capital and producing sort of capital goods instead of uh, spending money on immediate consumption and things like that. Yes, absolutely. And Bitcoin, of course, really makes you more prudent. It makes you allocate right. your resources more effectively. Uh, but, you know, it, it, especially with the aspect of spending it, there is Gresham's law here applied because you have the really, really sound money, the hard money, Bitcoin, which is maybe going to increase in value quite a bit because it's really rare. And on the other hand, you have government fiat, uh, which is being inflated to shit every single hour, every single second. If you go to the mm -hmm. store and you want to buy a coffee, which are you going to use first? Either the money that is going to be worthless tomorrow or the money that is going to be worth everything tomorrow. Well, of course, you're going to hold back the precious Bitcoin, you're going to hodl your Bitcoin, and you're going to spend the fiat. So absolutely, in, in this context, you will, you will always hold your Bitcoin if you still have fiat left. But where does Gresham's law end? Well, as soon as you have given away your last note of fiat, you only have Bitcoin. So now if you are at the coffee store, you no longer have to ask the question, what am I going to spend? You know, oh, damn, <laughs> now I have to spend my Bitcoin. It's come to that point. And, you know, although this is a beautiful moment where, you know, like, OK, it's only Bitcoin for me now. Um, it, it is scary in that, in that uh, one aspect that it really you no longer can spend this cheap money. Now you have to give away your precious money. And that is something that in, even enhances the prudence and, and the future oriented thinking. And I've experienced that since I've been living with Bitcoin for one and a half years now. It really changes your mind completely. Right. Yeah. You definitely become uh, more sort of stoic and you start sort of thinking things much, much more carefully. And I definitely agree with. Uh, Hulsmans and Safetyn, uh, they talk about sort of these effects on culture a lot. And they say that um, a few people talk about this, but really the money is such an important thing because it's essentially 50% of every transaction, as they say. And the nature of money and like the way, the, the, the way it's controlled, uh, the way it's produced, the way it's transferred, etc. Um, I believe that it's a very astute observation that it definitely has uh, significant implications both on yourself as an individual and of course by extension on society at large. So I do believe the argument that a sounder money is likely to make a society more virtuous, more patient, more sort of stoic and more um, long-term oriented rather than just what's gonna happen to me today. Um, a lot of books, like even outside of, even outside of uh, Austrian economics or ethics or anything like that, a lot of people, uh, a lot of sort of, uh, for example, self improvement or personal development or success books, they always talk about that the successful people they aren't the ones who are thinking, oh, how am I just gonna like live today or how am I just gonna get this or that today? Uh, they're the ones who are thinking seven years from now, eight years from now, and really any important and major undertaking. It can be completed in a week or a month. It really needs to be a multi-year affair. And sort of this kind of a mildly deflationary money is going to encourage these long-term projects, which I think is very exciting for the history of the world. And that is why a lot of Bitcoin maximalists joke that uh, Bitcoin is going to take Bitcoin is going to take us into outer space because it's going to accelerate the development of all technologies that matter. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's a war of the mind. It really is. This has a lot to do with culture, with, with uh, incentives and, and, you know, with your own mind and, and your own understanding of, of what, this, uh, what this thing can do. And I agree that it will 
advance all kinds of technology uh, if we get or when we get to this sound money aspect of Bitcoin. But of course, so far, we have not reached it yet. Uh, so I, I've been saying for, for a bit now that because of this high inflation rate, we have seen a lot of malinvestments, especially in the mining sector. Uh, and, you know, we all know that there has been a drastic increase in the hashing power uh, of the Bitcoin network basically since forever. Right. Uh, it's been immense. It's been pushing the cutting edge of hardware technology, hardware chip yes. technology. Um, and, you know, th this is quite exponential. Uh, so, Murad, do you think that there have been malinvestments in this area or do you think that this is just because Bitcoin is such a useful thing and uh, because it just is this uh, fundamentally new technology? So I agree with you that the high inflation early on led to this sort of um, make Bitcoin on-chain payments and this whole Bcash, etc., this kind of philosophy. But people are divided. I I'm still not sure whether... Um, it, it has led to malinvestments in mining as well. So there certainly have been malinvestments in sort of in the slices of the industry and different niches of the industry. But my question to you is, is your argument that there's too much security um, protecting the network and like Bitcoin can survive on less? Oh, that is a interesting question. If, if there currently is too much security, um, because I don't think so. Bitcoin right. is still tiny, right? It, right. Right now, it is marginally the best in its security. There is no other way that you can get more SHA-256 hashing power than we already have, like this instant. Um, so, you know, this is so, not... So it, to it has been going, it has been like uh, growing quite dramatically and diagonally, even in, during this bear market. Right, exactly. It doesn't stop. And... And the, the question really is if, uh, because I don't think that we have not enough, uh, I do think that we don't have enough security in the long run. I do not know if we have, uh, or if we need this much security right now. But, or, but, but I think like the counter argument is that the miners are likely strong believers in Bitcoin. And they are actually um, trying to get they, they are not looking at inflation today and they are not looking at Bitcoin today. They are, look, they are trying to get their hands on as much Bitcoin as possible 10 years from now. Uh, and Rodolfo Novak of OpenDime, he actually argues that a lot of like the miners, they are, especially in China, etc., they are long-term believers in Bitcoin and they are essentially, um, they have a lot of, they, like they don't need to sell that, like they don't dump all their Bitcoin as they get it. They are actually collecting as much as they can and they don't really have a problem with getting like fiat from elsewhere or from the founders themselves or from or on other things. Um, and they're actually, um, they're, they realize how disinflationary and how hard and how sound it will become. So they're essentially like making a massive, massive bet that it will actually be extremely useful. And so they're not looking at like at a multi-week price. They're looking at like a multi-decade price, you know, and they're sort of making a massive bet. So. Uh, it's like that's kind of the counter argument. Like even J.W. Weatherman, he says that, oh, like the hashing power will continue to increase uh, until it like consumes 10% of like military expenditures. Or Safetyn says 20% of the, like the more extreme view is that like 20% of the world's energy will be dedicated to Bitcoin. Um, and like that's completely fine. Well, you know, I, I, I see all those points and I, I agree with all of them, but I, do, I still think that there's a time element involved here because yes, Bitcoin will consume 10% of all human energy. Absolutely. If it really comes to right. fruition, it's right. worth <laughs> expanding this much energy for yeah. sound money. That's right. how important sound money is. I'm absolutely right. okay with that. Right. <laughs> uh, it's going to make the pie so much bigger. Um, so there's going to be so much more for those 90% yeah. that it's not consuming. Um, but what, what I, what, you know, we are right here. Bitcoin has made like this little dip so far. We need to come up here, right? Yeah. It's going to be a really long-term yeah. game. And what I'm wondering that now focusing in on this, that we have shot up like this already, but we only need to be down here, right? So yes, we need all that security. We still need much, much more of that security. But right. at this current moment, because the first 10, the first 20 years in Bitcoin are so heavily in, in incentivized by inflation. This is where all the money is going to be made for the rest. Right. 
Right. So the people are are tumbling over each other to get their hands on mining mining equipment on Bitcoin because it is so limited in the early years. But yeah. exactly that is what's going to further increase all these malinvestments in the short run. Right. So I actually think like uh, mining, like the hash rate graph, like if you super zoom out in the future, it will look like Y squared X. And it really like it, it, it will keep growing and essentially kind of like tamper out in my view. Mm, OK, but but uh, at what level? Because that would suggest that we humans will not further uh, consume more energy and more electricity. Right. That's true. Uh, but uh, eventually, the hope is that the mining industry and hardware, electricity, etc., it will get commoditized to such an extent that like the mining, uh, like MC equals MR, like the mining like expenditures would essentially uh, be like the, the the profit margins would like grow lower and lower and lower, right? So I like I do think the cash rate will keep on growing, and at some point it will generally balance out for the system as a whole. What's important is that uh, like the Bitcoin can withstand even a sovereign grade attack. But on the other hand, we can't really control what what a minor entrepreneur is going to do. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that the reason there is a big spike right now is because of high inflation right now. And in the future, that's not it's not going the, the block reward is going to be lower. So um, they would only make money through the fees. Now, I don't know if you know if you have an opinion on this, but a lot of people are concerned with how sort of theory of mining will change once we move from inflation to sort of the uh, transaction fees. Do you have an opinion there? Yeah, that's the thing, because Bitcoin hashing rate does not necessarily have to keep going up. There is a limit of how much the miner is getting paid for, right? And right. if we move to a Bitcoin gold or, or Bitcoin standard, then Bitcoin will be the, the base money. Right. And and because the stock to flow ratio will be so incredibly high, because the inflation inflation rate will be minimal in right. Bitcoin terms, uh, the future uh, in the future, we have to pay for all the security, not in the inflated money, but yeah. actually in the hard and sound Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, and all those subsidies, all those malinvestments, as you can call them will be drained again and they will be reallocated to this new state of how much of our precious bitcoin are we willing to give up for security right and and, and you think that uh essentially what's going to happen is only the best most cost effective miners will remain who can still remain profitable even if they're only paid with the fees yeah, but, but that's how Bitcoin functions all the time, right? The miners right. will be marginally profitable, you know, even a couple of years ago with that high of an inflation. Uh, they will always be marginally profitable uh, in that current moment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's only marginally and some miners will be highly profitable while others will be highly, uh, you know, will carry high and heavy losses. Yeah. Uh, but yes, there will always be miners, even if only a couple people are using the system. Uh, the, the rules still apply. The system can still run. It's a protocol. It never ends. Right, right. Uh, um, so we have, of course, uh, talked now extensively about uh, a, a money in general. Uh, but, you know, what is important, of course, is the sound money aspect. And uh, uh, sorry, again, <laughs> the store of value aspect. And you had here a nice tweet, uh, again, which, by the way, check out Murat on, on Twitter. It's an amazing feat, absolutely worth a follow. And you're saying here, and I quote, if you want to see my framework for the most important criteria that will define the monetary store of value winner, in quotations, S. Uh, so if I pull up this, uh, this picture right here, uh, Murat, would you just expand on what we have here? Yeah, so I I generally just sat down and I because I firmly believe that like we need to first get a store of value, then a medium of exchange, then a unit of account. What matters for now, especially in terms of value accrual, especially in terms of absorbing wealth, especially in terms of what people will choose as their savings vehicle, especially in terms of which which like actual cryptocurrencies are going to rise in price. I sat down and thought, okay, so they have to compete against one another 
in terms of how good they are as a store of value. And now, in the past, several months ago, I used to think that actually, um, I used to believe that the end result will be not winner take all, but it will be winner take most in a power law distribution, kind of like 70, 20, 6, 4, like and kind of Pareto style going down. And I thought that like different currencies would differentiate themselves based on different properties, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that maybe sort of a privacy coins like Monero and Zcash could have their own niche and Bitcoin could be digital gold. But you know, increasingly I realized that that is probably wrong and that it will actually be winner take all with Bitcoin being like 95% or more. And I'm realizing that just like, let's say there are 20 criteria for a store of value. Um, the most important things, like just even outside of this list, people need to understand that money is uh, something, among other things, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe describes money as an anxiety re reduction tool. And the demand to hold money is a tool to reduce your anxiety about an uncertainty of, a, of, of an uncertain future. And essentially, money is something that is... Uh, the most liquid, the most uh, recognizable, the most saleable, uh, the most marketable. And I've realized that even if, um, even if, if, even if we say, let, let's take Monero or Zcash or some other privacy coin, even if they're better at Bitcoin in one out of 20 criteria, Bitcoin is superior in 19 of the 20 others. And it's just so much further ahead in growth, so much further ahead in development, so much further ahead in hash power, security, uh, the amount of intellectual resources and engineers dedicated to it, um, so much ahead in terms of its network effects and, and brand and everything else that I think it's unlikely that other crypto assets have a strong chance to outcompete Bitcoin in in sort of in its monetization and its demand as a store of value because it's risky to be parking wealth uh, like all the speculation aside and all the euphoria aside at a certain point in time at a certain equilibrium it is risky to park your wealth or to use something as money that is not the most dominant money and that's not the hardest money and that's not the biggest and the most liquid and the most highest volume and the most saleable money. So that's why I increasingly believe that the cryptocurrency market is actually going to be winner take all with uh, Bitcoin by far the most likely contender for victory. And if you say that Bitcoin is going to be a winner take all, you know, I agree with you, but many people will think that this is a, a monopoly then, right. uh, you know, th this is bad. Uh, so could you elaborate on why having a winner take all money, a one single money is actually a good thing? on the free market. So it's there's a crucial difference. There is a monopoly on money which is top down, ordained by the government by legal tenders or state decrees or debt extinguishing laws or like local monopoly on currency production, or military violence, coercion, etc. But there is another in which uh, the dominant money is chosen freely and voluntarily and organically by the free market. There's no bosses here. There's no dictators here. There's no like. Uh, there's no kings here. Uh, I think it's a natural progress. Just like um, after gold, uh, after it became common to get sort of paper vouchers for gold, um, it kind of, like the the ratio between uh, gold and silver after 1870s onwards, it really gold really skyrocketed. And essentially, like that, we don't have many examples there, but that is a very, very strong data point in my view in, in showing how, especially for a global money, you want uh, something converging to one. And I think it's not going to be done coercively or like forced on you, but I think people will gain theoretically and naturally converge on one money. It's similar to, uh, it's, I mean, it's all from a technological perspective, it's also a protocol. And like, we don't have several intranets, we have one internet and that connects the world. Like imagine if you knew, um, French, German, Russian, Arabic, Chinese, and English and Spanish, then you could like travel the world and speak to all the people. And that's like kind of similar. Like if Bitcoin is accepted and valued as a store of value and accepted as 
a unit of account and money everywhere, then you can essentially like the the trading and the commerce, it can all sort of expand really, really hugely. Absolutely, I 100% agree. The more people use yep. this network, the more value will it have. It's NetCap's law, right? The, the value of the network is the number of nodes squared. And this is exactly what will happen. The more people will, uh, will you know, have this money and and value it uh, the more they will use it and uh, you know further increase its value you said that there are no kings in bitcoin <laughs> and th that's one point where i disagree with you because i think that there are many kings of bitcoin thousands of them why right. if you run a bitcoin full node you set your own rules you can do whatever you want set whatever rules you want to have then you go on the network and you check if anyone is playing by your rules. If yes, you accept, you accept them to your kingdom of your own rules, right? If not, you kick them out and you ignore them forever and ever. You will never ever talk to them again, right? So you also execute your laws. And if someone breaks them, you know, you, you, you punish them by ignoring them. Uh, so you are the judge, jury, executioner of your money. You are your king of your money. So right. if you are a Bitcoin, a runner, a owner of a Bitcoin full note, then you are literally the king of Bitcoin. So if you are the king of Bitcoin in the chat, first of all, hit the like button because that's going to be fantastic. And let, honestly, that, let us know. I do want to know how many kings of Bitcoin we're talking to right now. And of course, Murad, are you a king of Bitcoin? Are you running a full note? Of course I am. Yes, of course. Why? Uh, it's important, like have, running your you're running your full node is part of what makes you a sovereign individual in in bitcoin and that's uh just like you said like you 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 enforce your own rules uh you validate sort of uh, payments in particular but i think it's important to understand a uh, peter wallace point uh be uh, using it in particular if you're in payments and like to validate actual transactions exactly and you know the user activated soft fork again showed us very much so that it doesn't matter what the protocol change is it really doesn't matter if you increase the block size if you increase the signature algorithm if you increase the money supply if you change consensus rules you have to fight the users you have to fight the full notes and if they do not upgrade bad luck there's nothing nothing you can do if we don't upgrade our software you you have no chance whatsoever uh, so this is why we run a full note not because it's it supports the network on the contrary it defends me against the network because it makes me the full sovereign of the money and do you think that it will ever be likely that someone will change the difficulty adjustment algorithm or that someone will change the inflation ratio of Bitcoin? If anything ever changes in Bitcoin, I think that is the last thing that could ever change. It's, it's, it's the defining aspect of Bitcoin. And I think that many Bitcoiners would go to the grave before allowing something like that to happen. And I like to say that UASF, and no 2x and all these sort of battle scars, UASF in particular, was one of the most bullish things to ever happen for Bitcoin. And I think a lot of people ha still have not internalized that. Uh, it really showed that the users are the ones who control the network, not the miners, not the companies, not the exchanges, not anyone else. And I think that's really, really powerful. Um, and Bitcoin is really getting more and more robust after each of these uh, instances and after deflecting more and more of these sort of social and economic attacks. Oh, absolutely. The, the more hit, the more shit hits Bitcoin, the stronger it gets. It's the sewer rat, as Andreas Antonopoulos likes to say. It's the anti-fragile system, as Nassim Taleb likes to say. Uh, so, and I agree with you, Mustad. That is that there, the, the main aspect of Bitcoin, why it is so important, is is not that it just has the economic principles of sound money written in the code, but it is that the code is unchangeable because only if it is unchangeable, then we have 
a opportunity of having full calculation in the economy and having this sound money. And of course, there are other cryptocurrencies on this market, uh, th which is, by the way, perfect because we want to have competition. But then <laughs> there's also a shit show like Ethereum. Uh, so Murat, you have another amazing tweet here. <laughs> this is precisely why Ethereum is doomed for failure. No rational individual will ever store their wealth in a coin led by an inflationist. No free market will converge on a monetary standard whose leaders espouse redistribution of wealth. And this, of course, goes back here to this tweet. tweet. Oh, this is going to be a, a tweet chain. So first, the tweet of Pierre Richard, uh, another great follow, host of the uh, Satoshi or founder of the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute and host of the uh, Noted podcast. The Bitcoin is for free market Austrians, I guess to whom you're talking to right now. And Ethereum is for communist Marxists. And this all goes back to the final tweet, tweet in this chain by Vitalik, non-giver of Ether. Uh, well, he's actually a taker of Ether. The idea that an individual can have an immutable right to own a fixed percentage of all the world's money indefinitely, on the other hand, feels very oligarchic so murad uh, there's been i'm what is that what is that <laughs> really honestly like in a very like to to be very calm in my response i think like tweeting this is strong this is here i mean uh, Contrary to what many people believe in the that actually like Bitcoin adoption and the next Bitcoin of like or the next two or three waves of Bitcoin's price appreciation will come from the wealthy, will come from the high net worth individuals around the world. And look, like those individuals will choose Bitcoin because it's uninflatable. And the reason Bitcoin is valuable, the reason Bitcoin has a high price, which is continuously rising, is because more and more people are realizing that despite its volatility, you can put your wealth into Bitcoin and nobody can steal your wealth. Nobody can seize your wealth and nobody can inflate your wealth. But to Vitalik, as he said, Austrian economics is too rigid and it doesn't explain the complexities of the modern world. And he thinks that um, owning a certain amount of um, the money supply is very good, but really um, that is such a silly statement because you not own the the exact same fixed money supply because as we've already discussed eventually you do need to spend some of your money and the money will get circulated um, and what's important is that the purpose of bitcoin isn't to get rid of the, the sort of these touchy-feely topics of wealth inequality or anything like that the point of bitcoin is that so that the fruits of your labor and if um, Vitalik, who's the founder of Ethereum, mentions that uh, owning, the same, owning the same fixed percentage of, of all the world's money is oligarchic, that is, to me, as an investor, is very spooky. If I held any Ethereum, which I don't, uh, I would immediately dump it after hearing something like this, or at least I would be more likely to dump it if I heard something like this. Because I would essentially, that would essentially signal to me that there might be more dilution coming. There might be more inflation coming. And as we've already discussed, what makes me powerful is that uh, and really that is make Bitcoin win. It's precisely the fact that nobody like this can ever make something like that happen. It, it's funny that you bring up that this might lead to, to future inflation, which I absolutely agree with you. But that is the exact same thing as that we have with the Fed, that people are now judging the color of Janet Yellen's jacket, blazer, right. on right. whether they, she will increase the money supply or not. It's the you know, exact same it's thing. Crazy. You know, there's probably uh, 100 or 200 uh, interest rate analysts on Wall Street and around the world, probably more. Uh, who's essentially like whose job or who's either full-time job or either many many hours of their job is to essentially be able to anticipate central banking decisions which is just so many man hours wasted and so many resources wasted 
just to anticipate some bureaucrats like mood swing or 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 some centralized authorities like decision. Uh, to me, really, all of these decisions need to be made by the free market and the free market alone. Oh, absolutely, because not nobody has uh, you know ha has the power to know everything. Number one, but even if they would know everything, they don't have prices if it's only one economic actor, uh, which right. means that they cannot allocate resources. And you know, a, a quote by Vitalik, as he said, it's it's it really is fundamentally disturbing, and it it builds up on the already huge pile of, of poop that Ether has piled up so far, and you know, it's this little cherry on top. And because we do not know what Ether is going to do in the future, they have hard forked already several times on a regular schedule, right? They have this difficulty adjustment bump, which requires them of doing a hard fork because they are not competent enough to write good code, right? Uh, so they cannot advance the scaling method as they thought they could. So they have right. to hard fork it, which is the antithesis of a sound money policy, of a money that emerges on the free market and does not change. Uh, so, you know, well, not, that's the thing. That's the thing. I don't I think most most Ethereum supporters and most Ethereum developers and holders, they don't really care about sound money. Exactly. They care about crypto kitties. They <laughs> they, they, yeah. they, can, they are still caught in this inflated money supply uh, ideology. They, they are still on a fiat uh, mindset on a uh, low time. Uh, on, sorry, on a high time preference. Uh, they want to have this stuff now. Uh, so they compromise on security, they compromise on integrity. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, nice if you want to do this new startup thing. Uh, by the way, yeah. the entire Silicon Valley uh, aspect was heavily influenced by fiat culture. Um, so, you know, all this, this uh, Silicon Valley stuff might not be how Bitcoin will play out because it is fundamentally different. And maybe to lead in into, into another question, Murat, for you is that uh, the Internet is maybe one of the few innovations that we have seen in recent times. All the other stuff, radio waves, the television, uh, uh, the car, the steam engine, electricity, is all stuff from, from the gold uh, standard period. Where right. We had sound money. Um, and of course, the internet being one of the few things that fiat money innovated on, um, it, it does have some flaws. And it, it is influenced by this heavy consumer culture in, in its fundamental uh, you know, social media uh, aspects. So do you think that the internet itself will change with a sound money uh, as Bitcoin? Um, I hope it does. And I hope it becomes uh, more decentralized, just like Bitcoin is decentralized. Uh, a lot of internet really, a lot of pockets of the internet and internet as a whole is really, has a lot of centralized elements these days. Um, and my hope is that just like the money is free, um, we will be able to uh, leverage Bitcoin and other decentralized technologies like it to make the flow of information even freer as well and to essentially be able to get rid of um, firewalls and censorship and, and all these things as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really do think that we the cypherpunks, you know, the early creators of the internet, they had the, the this beauty of the cyber utopia in, in mind when creating it. But because they did not have a money unit, they could not fully realize it. Right. Uh, and uh, of course, because they didn't make their own monetary policy, this means that they were fully, you know, had to work on the fiat standard of several different countries, which is, of course, horrible for a global network like the internet. So now that the internet itself has a native currency that is not, you know, coupled by any other nation uh, in meat space, uh, now and of course this currency is Bitcoin and is fundamentally sound in its in its economic policy, which is of course the cypherpunk ideal, the aspects of liberty and property rights. Uh, so it, it's really going to be interesting to see if. All those cipher utopia, uh, cypherpunk utopias, those those pirate utopias, will now come to fruition now that we have Bitcoin. Yeah, I like to say that one of the ways that I think about Bitcoin, or I tell newcomers about Bitcoin, is that imagine if in, if the internet is a country, and Bitcoin is the internet's currency, um, but it's perfectly strict in its supply. It's a it will, I believe, become the best savings mechanism ever invented. 
And there's no capital controls, no taxes, no inflation, no censorship, no KYC, and nothing like that. And I think that in the coming 10 to 15 years, a lot of wealth will flow into this country. Absolutely, right? It's, it's going to be the speculative uh, attack. People will go into debt in the fiat money, right. further increasing further increasing the money supply and uh, further decreasing the value of the fiat money, uh, right. which, which will lead to the fact that, uh, of course, they will buy Bitcoin with that, they will buy hard money with it, which will not increase in money in the money supply. Uh, and uh, this will mean that it will further go up in value. Uh, so those who hold fiat currency the longest, who hold the V currency at longest, will see a rapid displacement of their wealth to those who are on the sound monetary standard. Right. You know, I agree. And, and we've talked a lot about uh, the store of value aspect. And of course, uh, yes, the store of value taken in a uh, inflation sense, that inflation is theft. It's really important to take care of that. Bitcoin, of course, does that. Uh, but also important is that it is private, that it is anonymous. Because if people know that you have a stack of gold, they will take it away from you. Same if people know that you have a stack of Bitcoin, they will take it away from you. So, of course, Bitcoin does not have the anonymity features so far. Uh, so what, what are your thoughts here? Is this really hindering Bitcoin? Lightning privacy is much better than having the wasabi wallet that no par is working on we have a lot of the developments by the samurai team uh i i believe that bitcoin's privacy and fungibility will gradually improve um there is it's there's a lot of sort of debate whether you absolute privacy is good for air actually absolute privacy on the base layer makes it a bit difficult to audit the money supply and it essentially challenges the monetary qualities of Bitcoin. So um, honestly, I think like as layer two and layer three solutions keep improving, Bitcoin will be good enough for most people in my view. And really, if even if, like if you just differentiate on privacy, it, you will have a really hard time to compete. Absolutely. Right. And you have here a, a tweet storm that talks exactly about that. And especially in regard uh, to Zcash, because Zcash does not have these, uh, you know, they do have maybe some of the more uh, an anonymity features. Um, they pay, of course, a heavy cost of no scalability. Uh, but further, they have this huge problem of the trusted setup, of the setup that makes it possible to create infinite amount of money without ever uh, somebody knowing about it. Uh, so this will mean that we have a inflation, but the entrepreneurs would not even know that the inflation is happening. Uh, so this would double yeah. down on the boom and bust cycle here. Kind of like today, right? <laughs> kind of like with the fiat system. But but yeah, absolutely. But probably even worse because at right. least we have right. some data on the on the fiat system. Here right. we would right. have no possibility whatsoever. Right. And, and, you know, maybe to, to elaborate uh, here on, where was this one? Uh, mm -hmm. I have this one really nice, uh, nice quote from this here. Oh, where it is. The reason gold was used as money more than granite is no longer relevant. And you disagree with this statement. Uh, so why exactly is that? Yeah, so like a lot of people argue that uh, a lot of people argue they take a very narrow view as money as only like the medium of exchange component and they essentially argue that oh monies are just abstractions they're just stories uh and money is money becomes money if it's they they like to use the quote money becomes money if it's only used as money but once again that that, that only uses sort of the payment or the transactional capacity and uh nick zabo points out that yes monies are stories and abstractions but they are not arbitrary stories they're not random stories and often throughout history they converge to certain qualities in particularly the the high stock to flow ratio and it is that stock to flow ratio um that makes it um that makes sort of people or the free market game theoretically converge towards that one 
because essentially like it's like a set of evolutionary experiments let's say different villages use different kinds of money and it is likely that throughout hundreds or thousands of years it would be those that use the hard money that survive and thrive because no one else can inflate them absolutely yes and and i agree with, with what you said here and, and would elaborate that it is already used as a medium of exchange, maybe not on the macro level, maybe not in the, you know, seen on a global entire space, but on the individual space, yes, yep. it can be used as 100% money. Why? Because it can already be used as both a unit of account, a store of value and a medium of exchange. Uh, and when does this happen? As soon as Gresham's law ends, as soon as the individual no longer has dirty fiat money, and as soon as it only has the valuable Bitcoin, because then the incentives will align that eventually you will have to spend some of those Bitcoin. And right. if, if you ever reach that state without any fiat money, then you are using this unit of account, uh, or, or you know, more, more in general, the stored value and medium of exchange, more importantly here, as a 100% money. And this has happened for many people since 2011, 2012. Yeah. For sure, for sure. So maybe then to go back to, uh, to you know, the first tweet that we uh, showed here um, is that, yes, it will take time. Oh, no, I think I closed it. Yes, it, it will take time that you are, that we have reached this. Um, do you think that we can estimate how long it will take us? for Bitcoin to be used as day-to-day -day transactional money? No, more more to the fact that it will be used as a, a complete, um, full, uh, global, uh, you know, a store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account, to the point that it has reached the top right of, of your chart here as a full global money. Uh, do you well, think I that think we can time this? I, um, it's really hard to say because it really depends on people understanding like what's actually going on. But um, I think it's definitely happening in our lifetime. Um, and I think probably inside 25 years, hopefully faster. Hopefully faster. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because if, you know, in 20 years, we will already be at a really, really low inflation rate. And right. uh, by, by then we will have this immense sound money aspect. Yes. Uh, but the interesting thing is, although theoretically after it is well established, this sound, sound money will, will still be rather stable in value. What we might see is that even though the stock to coin is already incredibly high, because not that many pe people will be using it, um, as you know, as more and more people are, regardless because of this low inflation rate, the per, the increase in purchasing power will still be drastic, probably even more drastic than we've seen so far. So, you know, can we maybe say that all this current increase in value of one Bitcoin has been hampered by all this inflation and will this hampering stop? Yeah. Um... I definitely think that um, when you get hampered by this inflation, Bitcoin's inflation, or you mean like external outside inflation? Purely speaking in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah, so um, that's precisely why I'm so excited about happenings because essentially with every four years that this happening happens, Bitcoin becomes harder money and sounder money. And I believe that by 2021 or 2022, Bitcoin's uh, stock to flow ratio is going to drop below that of gold. Now, that's amazing. Some people argue that, oh, we have to stop counting from the 21 million. We have to start counting because of the losses. Unfortunately, we have to start counting from like the 17 million number. And if that and the inflation is 3.8% that it is right now, but it's actually like 5 or 6% or something, it doesn't matter. But it, 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 it doesn't matter. Like eventually, um, the stock to flow ratio is going to drop below that of gold. And a lot of sort of, uh, and several others, they argue that 
even though like Bitcoin is increasingly going to be, be sound money, right now that's not felt. Uh, and right now sort of people don't sort of feel like naturally, intuitively, cognitively feel that yet. But as we get closer and closer to that fixed supply, Bitcoin's hardness will be incredible. And uh, Pierre Rochard often says that we've never had not just the money, but we've never had an asset this scarce before. This hardcore, intensely, enforceably, strictly scarce before. And nobody knows what's actually going to happen. Um, I actually believe that like at the end of the day, like in the long run equilibrium. So like all fiat currencies today are like 90 trillion uh, and monetary metals are 8 trillion. Let's just round it up and say 100 trillion in days of $18. So I think that Bitcoin at its peak is going to be twice as big at least because if there's 90 trillion being stored in fiat, which is um, a, it's a leaky bag, which is inflationary. And two, you have sort of kind of like different fiats around the world. Bitcoin is superior in like all of these aspects. And it, I think like the marginal propensity to hold Bitcoin could be so high that it could like the total, it could actually expand the demand of holding money. And uh, people argue that Today, like you look at most asset managers, hedge funds, et cetera, they have at most five, 10% of their balance sheets in cash. But in the, because it's, because like holding it is unprofitable because it's losing purchasing power. In the future, um, it's possible that the people would store 20 to 30% of their wealth in, in cash, which would be Bitcoin. Um, and so like the total size of the total market size of Bitcoin, I'm not even counting hyperinflation. I'm talking like in today's 2018 dollars. Could be twice as big which is like quite remarkable absolutely and i experience this working at deutsche bank quite a lot because we tell our customers in the in the private banking department to, uh, to not store their wealth in money to not store their wealth in the quote-unquote store of value which is called money right because it is being inflated into nothingness and you don't even get a a payment you don't even get interest rate for, for right. you know for, for this money and uh, which, of course, money does not have to have to give you interest. They have to give you interest rate. Right. But because it is all a debt based system, it ought to give you interest uh, because you are not you know, you're loaning out uh, your money. If you put it into the bank account, you're loaning it out to the bank. Uh, pretty much a unsecured loan, uh, which is an a fraction reserve system. So you're giving away right. your money and uh, you're not giving any interest for that. Uh, so, so do you think that we need this or, or that it will be useful for Bitcoin to have a, a interest rate, to have um, you know, a way to, to lend Bitcoin uh, uh, more, more effectively? Or do you think that, or yeah, just louder than that? Yeah, of course. Uh, of course, we're going to have a, a debt system on Bitcoin. We, you, we need to have, a, we will gonna have a financial system. We will have interest rates. It's just that very likely the system is going to be full reserve or very close to full reserve. And um, I believe that like it's, it's just going to be all the same. It's just that expanding the money supply and the credit creation uh, in the financial system is going to not be as unconstrained as it is today, which I think is going to be quite wonderful. Oh, yes, absolutely. This is going to be really interesting. Uh, but the question that, that myself, what ha happens if we are in this deflationary money? that increases in value. Uh, you know, what happens if today you want to, uh, you know, you want to borrow one Bitcoin, which of course in today's term has one Bitcoin in purchasing power, and you want to pay back one Bitcoin in 10 years. But, you know, if you did, um, you know, one Bitcoin back in 2009 was worth nothing. One Bitcoin worth today is quite a lot, right? A couple thousand bucks worth in purchasing power, a dollars. Um, and the question is, uh, will back that loan in the unit in the amount of Bitcoin. Uh, so will you actually hold on to this Bitcoin and after paying interest, will you pay back one Bitcoin, um, much much more in purchasing power for you, or would you rather uh, pay back the current purchasing power? Um, of one Bitcoin previously. So if today one Bitcoin can buy one car and tomorrow a Bitcoin can buy an entire house, 
then you still only pay back a fraction of a Bitcoin, that much, uh, that much uh, which would get you a car. Well, um, I'm, I think like you would, you would still like, if you give out a loan for one Bitcoin, I believe, I guess you would expect like 1.06 Bitcoin in return, right? Even though it's deflationary, you, there would still be an interest rate that would have to be commensurate with the risks of like certain like loans and certain debts, certain investments, etc. What do you think about this? Exactly. Absolutely. There are risks in loaning out your money uh, and, and they will have to be factored in. Um, but especially because there is such a high opportunity cost of loaning out your Bitcoin, just holding it, right? This right. opportunity cost has also be paid for. And this is what right. will make the, the credit market in Bitcoin really expensive. Well, why? Because credit ought to be expensive because you are you're taking... Uh, you know, uh, you're going into debt. This is something that might not be that good to do. You know, uh, so maybe try financing it. Uh, you know, the project for yourself with your own equity money. Um, so it's really, it's going to be really curious to see the uh, the level of decrease in the in the loan market in general. And of course, this this goes into fractional reserve. This goes into the derivatives and and all uh, you know the pyramid scheme of the fiat money, which always increases the money supply with a loan so do you think that we will or, or how much of a shift will we see in the loan market between the fiat system and the bitcoin system the amount of the amount of uh credit and lending would probably have to shrink right um and and i i agree uh, and this might be you know, one of the major changes that will come about in, in this sound money. Uh, and of course, uh, the changes will be much dress or, you know, uh, much more sweeping. Uh, and we've elaborated in the last couple uh, hours of this discussion exactly uh, how grandiose all this, all these changes will be that Bitcoin will usher in into this new economy, into this new uh, sound and hard money. Right. So, Murat, I, I thank you very much for joining us. Um, and just to wrap it up, do you, do you have anything else that we did not talk about that we would like to mention? Um, no, I just wanted to really thank you. I've been watching World Crypto Network for many, many months, not years. And, uh, please keep on doing what you guys are doing, promoting Bitcoin, promoting Austrian economics. And uh, once again, thank you for inviting me. And it was a huge pleasure. Uh, the, the pleasure was all on my side, Murad. It was uh, fantastic talking to you. Uh, so would you like to tell the people where they can find you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I guess the best place is Twitter, at MustStopMurad. Yeah, and, and how did you come up with that Twitter handle? Because uh, it is so perfect. <laughs> oh, I just, 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 just something for fun. <laughs> okay, th uh, that is nice. Well, guys, uh, thank you for joining us. It was absolutely a fantastic discussion. Um, if you want to find out uh, more about myself, uh, go to Twitter at Hillebrand Max. You can find uh, all the nice uh, tweets and quotes and whatever um, I, I want to talk about there. If you want to support my effort into uh, bringing you a, a video on the amazing Purism laptop, uh, you can donate to that, uh, we're, uh, to this fundraiser with the address shown here on the screen. Uh, we will uh, purchase with this money the Purism Librem 15. Uh, the amazing laptop that is 100% open source and protects your security and privacy. Uh, so this is uh, fantastic. We already have two donations so far. Uh, still a bit to go, uh, roughly 0.03 Bitcoin, um, not just for the laptop, I got a, a few other stuff for that, uh, but just, you know, a third of a Bitcoin. I think that's uh, just, we can change it again anytime. Uh, it was, again, a pleasure talking to Murat here uh, on the latest version of, or in the latest show here, on read Rothbard and use Bitcoin, uh, where we, of course, talk about that aspect. We did that quite a lot. Uh, but of course, we also talked about uh, the aspect of using Bitcoin uh, quite a lot in this chat. Uh, so Murad, I really thank you for joining us today. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I hope that we'll see each other on one of the next shows soon again. For sure, man. Uh, definitely. Bye-bye. Looking, looking forward to it. See you. See you guys. Bye-bye.